Good evening and welcome to the 2023 Sir James Plimsoll Lecture, brought to you as part of the University of Tasmania's Island of Ideas online public lecture series, in partnership with the Tasmanian branch of the Australian Institute of International Affairs and the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. A special welcome to our honoured guests this evening, Ruth Baird, the Director of the Tasmanian State Office of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, Kim Boyer, the President of the Tasmanian branch of the Australian Institute of International Affairs, and our University of Tasmania Chancellor, Alison Watkins. And most importantly of all, a very warm welcome to Kathleen Plimsoll, niece of Sir James Plimsoll, and her son, Christian plimsoll Kanak, who have travelled once again from Sydney to be with us today. We're simply delighted to welcome you back to Hobart and to our university. We cherish our long association with your family. As a reflection of our institution's recognition of the deep history and culture of this island, the University of Tasmania wishes to acknowledge the traditional owners of Lutruwita, Tasmania, the Muanina and Palawa people. The Palawa are the traditional custodians on the land from which we are broadcasting today, from Nipaluna, Hobart. We pay our deepest respect to elders past and present and to those who did not make elder status. We acknowledge the histories of storytelling, knowledge sharing and caring for land. So good evening, everyone. I'm Professor Nicholas Farrelly and I have the great privilege of serving as Head of Social Sciences here at the University of Tasmania. Um, I lead a, an energetic interdisciplinary team and as well as teaching all of Tasmania's police officers and social workers and many of its future policy makers and community leaders, we're proud that we have a long history in this university of engaging with our friends across Asia. Um, some of us indeed have spent our entire academic careers focused on Australia's relationships with Asia. And it's in this context that I'm particularly excited about tonight's Plimsoll Lecture. It happens that I've known our speaker for, for a long time, now going back some decades, um, since well before he and far too many others were so justly, so unjustly imprisoned by the Myanmar military regime. And it is, Sean, a, a deep honour for our university and for Tasmania um, that we can welcome you. Um, you're humble, eloquent and courageous, uh, and it's quite fitting that you're delivering our Plimsoll Lecture tonight. Now, though, it's my great pleasure to invite the Chancellor of the University of Tasmania, Alison Watkins, to introduce tonight's lecture and our wonderful speaker. Chancellor. On behalf of the University of Tasmania, I'd like to express a heartfelt welcome to you all as we gather here tonight, some of us online and others here in the room for the 2023 Sir James Plimsoll Lecture. In conjunction with our partners from the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade and the Australian Institute of International Affairs, the Plimsoll Lecture has been part of our university's calendar since 2007. Since its inception, the events showcased the expertise and insights of a really impressive group of international relations thinkers and practitioners. Some of our Plimsoll lecturers have included the Honourable Alexander Downer, MP, the then Minister for Foreign Affairs, the Honourable Kevin Rudd, MP, when he was also Minister for Foreign Affairs, His Excellency Jose Ramos Horta, Nobel Peace Prize laureate, now President of East Timor, the Honourable Michael Kirby, AC, CMG, former High Court Judge and Chair of the UN Commission of Inquiry on Human Rights Violations in North Korea. And just last year, National President of the Australian Institute of International Affairs, Dr. Heather Smith. Each of these speakers have linked their own experiences to the contributions of the distinguished Australian diplomat in whose memory the Plimsoll Lecture is delivered. Sir James is often described as the most impressive diplomat in the history of Australian international relations. After serving in the Australian Imperial Force, 
he was appointed to the Far Eastern Commission, tasked with overseeing the Allied Council for Japan during the occupation of that country. He was later appointed as Australia's permanent representative to the United Nations in 1959, launching his diplomatic career. Sir James went on to serve as Australia's High Commissioner to India, Ambassador to Nepal, and was then chose to be head, chosen to be head of the Department of External Affairs in 1965. Sir James later held roles as Ambassador to the United States, the USSR, Belgium, Luxembourg, and the EEC, and as High Commissioner to the United Kingdom and as Ambassador to Japan. Following his diplomatic career, he served as a highly popular and respected Governor of Tasmania from 1982 until his death in May 1987, only shortly after having his initial five-year term extended. His extraordinary career may have been very different. In 1947, while he was based in the USA, he received a letter from the economic advisor to the Bank of New South Wales advising of a vacancy for the position of Professor of Economics at the University of Tasmania, which he applied for. Fortunately or unfortunately, I'm not sure, Sir James was not successful in his application, instead becoming a first secretary in the Department of External Affairs. And despite this, when he was governor of Tasmania, Sir James displayed a great interest in the university and occasionally came unannounced to browse the university bookshop. He was awarded an honorary doctorate not long before he died. 20 years after his passing in 2005, the Australian Institute of International Affairs, the Department of Foreign Affairs and the University of Tasmania announced that they would sponsor an annual Sir James Plimsoll Lecture in Hobart. His contribution to the university, the state, the country and to the world is profound. And it's with deep respect that the Australian Institute of International Affairs, the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade and the university present this annual event in his name. 16 years after the inaugural lecture, I'm delighted to introduce you to our speaker tonight. He will provide us with a unique opportunity to learn from his real world example of academic excellence and resilience and the global impact of one individual's dedication to promoting democratic values and human rights. And of course, he's so much more than this. Described not just by his biographers as a person of bubbling enthusiasm and infectious warmth, Professor Sean Tunnell is an unwavering optimist. And for us mere mortals, this is really hard to understand given the 650 days of wrongful imprisonment he spent in the aptly named Myanmar prison in Sane. Prior to what he refers to as his sabbatical, Sean's humble working class beginning began in the suburbs of Sydney. He studied at Macquarie University and followed his humanitarian heart to become a world leading expert on the Burmese economy, believing that the right economic policies could provide prosperity for its suffering people. In fact, Professor Turnell wrote a seminal book on the subject, Fiery Dragons, Banks, Moneylenders and Microfinance in Burma. It was this expertise, reputation and philosophy that led him to become the economic advisor of Myanmar's democratically elected leader, Aung San Suu Kyi. Three days after Aung San Suu Kyi was deposed in a military coup and arrested, Sean was placed in solitary confinement by armed military police under fabricated charges. During his long imprisonment in Myanmar, friends, fellow economists, institutions and governments from around the world rallied together in a remarkable campaign for his release. This campaign provided us with deep insights into the dynamics of international relations, the role of civil society and the power of unity in promoting democratic values worldwide. With his release, 
In November, in November last year, we're truly honoured that Professor Sean Turnell can join us tonight to deliver what I'm certain will be an extraordinary story of hope, resilience and the power of friends. To deliver the 2023 Sir James Plimsoll Lecture, held hostage, national values, diplomacy and friendship, please welcome Professor Sean Turnell. Thank you very much, Alison. And um, I have some more thank yous at the end uh, because I have many people to thank. Um, suffice for the moment, perhaps, to say that I've been accused before of my optimism coming from just simply not paying attention. Uh, but we'll see whether you think that at the end of the speech. Um, OK, uh, first, what a great honour it is to be asked to give this year's uh, Sir James Plimsoll Lecture. Um, I suspect it's a great honour for anyone, but it's a particularly great honour for me uh, because Sir James has been one of my heroes for an awful long time, uh, 40 years, I would say, actually. Um, my PhD thesis, which was written last century, um, and it really was as long ago as that sounds, um, was all about the efforts of Australian economists in the 1940s and then again in the 50s as well to export what they knew about economics, but particularly Keynesian economics internationally. They tried to influence the creation of the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund uh, in ways that would allow countries like Australia to pursue policies of full employment but which didn't run into what they always used to call the brooding pessimism of Australia and our trade position. So they, they tried to mould the global economy to suit Australia. And Sir James Plimsoll was right at the forefront of that. It was before the career, the career that Alison referred to earlier, uh, but as a great economist, he was always a hero of mine. He featured in a lot of my work. So yeah, as I say, it's a really great honour for on this day for my name to be associated with his. So um, yeah, again, great honour to be able to, to deliver that today. Okay, um, but the first thing I want to do is do a bit of scene setting because I'm going to use that, part of my experience in Myanmar that was mentioned by Alison and Nick, um, to reflect on Australian foreign policy. So um, obviously in a lecture given uh, in honour of Sir James Plimsoll, I, I want to try and broaden it out in that front, rather than just simply be my own experiences, but to use my own experiences to suggest something about foreign policy, uh, where Australia is uh, and where it might go. But the extract that I want to talk through now, upon which I'll reflect, um, comes out of a book that I've just finished uh, on my experience being a political prisoner for 650 days uh, in Myanmar. And it describes the moment that I arrived outside Insane Prison. Insane Prison is the, the great central prison there in Yangon. Um, it's spelt different than the insane that we're used to, but uh, the sound is relevant, I think. So if I, I'll just read a bit from the extract and, and as I say, reflect upon it. So this is, this is from my recollection. Insane prison is as mad and bad as its name sounds. Built in the late 19th century by the British colonial regime that then ruled Myanmar, its pitiless looking frontage was designed to intimidate all who glimpsed it. It seemed to project a warning, defy authority and this is where you will rot. And now I was arriving at this dreadful place. Me, a 57-year-old professor of economics from Sydney, Australia, who had never even received a traffic ticket. A person who had spent his, just about his whole life in the halls of, academy, of the academy. A person whose idea of uncomfortable confrontation was telling a student their essay was really not that good a person utterly, terribly out of his depth. I knew that in a minute or two, I would be forced to enter this ghastly place and it would be one of those moments in life that you can never erase. I was sweating profusely. It was hot, very hot, sticky, humid. As my, might be expected, I was apprehensive 
of what was ahead, yet simultaneously oddly detached from everything too. I was conscious of this combination, that one part of my brain was observing my situation from afar, while another was grappling with how I was conducting myself. How I behaved now was going to be remembered by my captors, by other arriving prisoners, and not least by my inner soul. Now, I was then to spend the next 650 days in that system that I was entering at that particular point. But to find out what happened in that 650 days, well, you're going to have to buy the book. <laughs> so, because <laughs> what I want to do now uh, is reflect upon that, my time in the prison and how people reacted to me and how I reacted to things, uh, to say something, as I mentioned earlier, about foreign policy, about Australian foreign policy. And now if I was to sum it up, so Alison very kindly read out the name of the lecture tonight, which is, yeah, as she said, held hostage, national values, diplomacy and friendship. But if I still had my academic hat on, I would have probably called this, in the way that you know academics do, um, underappreciated aspects of democratic soft power in hostage diplomacy. So <laughs> if you are of an academic mind, that sort of captures the essence of it. Okay, so reflecting upon this then, um, during my 22 month experience as a political prisoner in Myanmar, my mind was often exercised by two particular cruel twists. Number one, Myanmar's ruling junta were using me as a tool to further target the Aung San Suu Kyi, who of course I was advisor to, and my other reformist friends who were always in, also in the prison. My whole purpose for being in Myanmar had been to help them. Now I was being used to destroy them. Secondly, it seemed to me that during my time as a prisoner in Myanmar, at the time, I hasten to add, I'm not making up this since, but at the time, that Australian policy towards Myanmar and the appropriate condemnation of the coup and all that followed was being muted to protect me and or to win my release. Once again, I was effectively being used by Myanmar's junta as a pawn to achieve ends that were the very opposite of what I was about and what I was there in Myanmar to do. So on top of all the other suffering, you know, the, the distress that I knew that I was imposing on my family, on my friends, the sheer awfulness of the conditions that I was living under, the even worse situation that was being visited upon my Myanmar friends who shared all of the horrible things that I was experiencing, but then some, on top, and then the, just the profound injustice being visited upon me and visited upon all my Myanmar friends. On top of all of that then, was that this idea that I was being used as a hostage to be bargained for bad ends. So that even in a sense, this bigger political picture was falling on top of me and that I felt incredible guilt about. But then I started to think about the bigger picture and I started to revisit this. Yes, there was some disappointment over Australian policy from me and from other people in the prison. But in the very fact, the very consideration that was clearly being extended to me came what I thought was a powerful message. Simply that I came from a country in which it was plausible that national policy was being determined in order to protect one of its citizens. Now that may be right or wrong, but if that's what was happening, that's an interesting thing in itself. More than that, that this was not an isolated one-off decision, but was something that in certain contexts could be assumed, expected, and could be regarded as many Australians, including my family and friends, as right and proper. Of course, I know that there are exceptions to this rule, and I'm sure we can think of many examples right now. 
But in some ways, the fact that these examples are so controversial might just mean that they're exceptions that perhaps prove the particular rule. Now, why did I come to this insight, if that's what it is? Why, why, why did I, um, and, and you know, one could argue that it might be a bit self-serving, right? Because it, it calmed the anxiety that I had about being uh, this way, but what triggered it? Well, it came from a comment by one of my fellow political prisoners, a lovely, lovely old man who was one of the uh, great reformers in Myanmar, the, the Minister of, of Planning and Finance, in fact. And he said to me at one point, this is very late in 2021, so I'd been there quite some time already. He said, you'll be okay, Sean. You come from a strong country and have a strong embassy behind you. Now, this was interesting um, because, and, and surprised me, um, because as I mentioned, you know, th there was implicit criticism at the time uh, that Australia wasn't speaking up enough, that, the, that we weren't sanctioning in solidarity with our traditional allies and so on. Uh, this was a source of, of some comment, and as I mentioned already, it, it was something that I worried about. Um, I also knew that in calling Australia a powerful country, and the embassy, a powerful embassy, that it had nothing to do with the military. Australia wasn't, you know, regarded as a great military power in Southeast Asia or anything. Um, although, actually, let me divert for a moment just to say that one thing that did come up while I was in the prison was the AUKUS deal. I had one of the um, prison guards come racing up to me one day and, and say, Sean, Australia's buying nuclear bombs and nuclear submarines. Um, and I didn't hear this until quite late, and, um, and it was after the invasion of Ukraine. And of course, here I am isolated from world events, and all I knew was two things. Russia had invaded Ukraine, Australia had nuclear weapons and nuclear submarines. And I thought, what on earth is going on out there? Um, <clears throat> but anyway, clearly it didn't mean that Australia was, uh, was a, you know, a, a vigorous military power in Southeast Asia. No, what my friend was talking about was precisely the idea that I alluded to earlier, that I had a government that was in its own way, and again, you know, one can argue the pros and cons of whether this is right or not, but in its own way, was in my corner. And even more important, beyond that, beyond simply government policy, government announcements, that all of this reflected a free society whose concerns drove that government, a people beyond government who could and would organise and agitate on my behalf, and they were doing it all the time. One of the real um, upsides of my situation was that the embassy was able to negotiate phone calls for me roughly every two weeks. So I had plenty of information coming to me of what people in Australia were doing, including many of the friends in, in this auditorium and I think listening tonight. A country where people were free to criticise their government and keep it accountable. For my friends in Department of Foreign Affairs, you will know how you were kept accountable by my wife and by my friends. A country where, for the most part, reason, and rationality are the wellsprings of policy. Seriously, <laughs> I think, by global comparisons. A country that did all of these things since it was and had the institutions of, for all of their faults and their complexities, a liberal democracy. And finally, and this was very well understood throughout the prison. People knew I, that I had Australia behind me, but they knew I had others as well. A country that had powerful friends in other nations of a similar disposition. Nations who were willing to come to the assistance of an Australian for reasons that were not simply transactional and that reflected some sort of system of shared values. Now I'm gonna come back to all these in a moment, but just to say that I think this reflects something about foreign policy and might reflect aspects of foreign policy and power and voice in foreign policy beyond simply what countries say, but what they are. Okay, all, but I've mentioned friendly countries, um, which brings me to friends more generally, old friends, new friends, and people who didn't know me from a bar of soap. Um, 
I had that expression in, in my book, by the way, and um, I wanted to know whether that was an expression that was in international currency, and I was told by American friends that they knew exactly what I was talking about um, when I spoke about that. Um, okay, and these friends, they organised offline, online, they wrote letters, they made placards, they attended vigils and demonstrations, they signed petitions, they organised conferences, they made speeches, they reached out to my wife, they reached out to my family. They didn't do this to gain anything, there was nothing in it for them. But they did all of this. And to paraphrase uh, Aung San Suu Kyi, uh, in one of her books, they used their freedom to promote mine. And it was noticed. It was noticed by me in the prison, it was an immense source of comfort. It was noticed by my fellow prisoners, as my suggestion of this wonderful old minister uh, would suggest. It was noted by the prison authorities who stood back aghast at all the things that were arriving for me, courtesy of the embassy, courtesy of some American friends who were pressing the, the very cages of the jail a lot of the time. It was mo uh, noted by the Myanmar police who usually had to escort the aforementioned to the prison by what passes for the judiciary in Myanmar, and it was noticed by Myanmar's leaders. It was the face of liberal democracy in the broadest meaning of that, not simply the government itself, but the entire society mobilised, in the case of Australia, but other countries as well, in all of its parts, standing up for some fundamental values. Now, I wanna just also talk um, about Myanmar now. So dealt with a little bit of my situation. I'm free now, I've been free for nearly 10 months, but of course the situation in Myanmar is very different. And there are things that I think Australia might do. Myanmar simply is a catastrophe at the moment. It's likely that tens of thousands have died since the coup on the 1st of February, 2021. Two to three million people, we don't really know the exact number, like we don't know the number of people killed either, have been made homeless. The country's best and brightest, the young people who just three years ago were planning with me in this wonderful institution that we created called the Myanmar Development Institute, are now scattered around the world. Some have been forced, well, into exile and so on. Some have taken up arms against the military where instead of you know, learning spreadsheets and the latest econometric techniques, are learning how to disassemble a rifle. And some are just forced to lay low. They're not contributing in the ways that they did only a few years earlier to what should have been a brighter future for their country. In terms of economics, something Sir James would care about too, and obviously I did, Myanmar's junta, has created a miasma of malfunction. Low growth, about a decade of economic growth has been erased since this military regime has been in place. And let's face it, Myanmar's economy, Myanmar's people were poor before that. The country is one of the poorest countries in the world, by far the poorest country, um, large country in Asia. A collapsing currency, it's worth about a third of what it was when the coup took place. Rising inflation, and this has real effects, of course. People, we used to often say in Myanmar that one of the upsides was that people never went without food. They went without a lot of other things, but they never went without food. Well, that's not, not the case anymore. People are too poor to buy food. The, the, the land and all that is still as it was, but people's ability to buy food is now much compromised. Chronic budget deficits. One of the great claims of the economic reformers that I used to help out was that we'd managed to reduce the budget deficit and the money financing that went in with it down to zero in 2020. Um, out of control money printing. Again, I mentioned we'd sort of got control of that. Now, that is the only recourse that the regime has to fund itself. The taxation system is totally destroyed. The country, uh, the leadership, the regime has no legitimacy. People avoid tax as much as they can. And of course, they're so much poorer now in any case in paying tax. So printing money is all they've got. 
and we see all the um, all the deadly things that come from that. A yawning trade deficit, growing indebtedness. The indebtedness of the country has tripled in the in the space of two years. A fragile banking system. Um, on the day of the coup, most of Myanmar's banks were insolvent. We were desperately trying to save them, and that was one of the last things we were doing. In fact, literally, on that last weekend before the coup, we were engaged in some fraught negotiations about trying to fix the banking system. I can only imagine now, given the collapsing economy and the erratic policy making, that all the banks must be insolvent now. I cannot imagine how, as a bank, you would stay solvent in the current situation. Increasing unemployment and probably above all, declining opportunities. Myanmar had begun to be a country in which people could have hope in the future. It had taken the first step on the rung to being one of Asia's tigers. The last and best of the tigers was a phrase we used to uh, always come out with, and, and now, you know, it's, it's not even a kitten. Um, accelerating criminalisation of the economy. Um, Myanmar has become a place where international criminals traffic people to for all sorts of nefarious activities that I'll mention briefly again later. Okay, against all of this, what can Australia do? Well, since this always brings up the question of sanctions, let me address this quite directly. Um, but in addressing that, one thing I think we need to be clear about in the past, we may have held the view that sanctions were important about in creating incentives for better behaviour of the regime. We can forget about that for the moment. This particular regime, this latest manifestation of military rule in Myanmar, is not to be turned by sanctions. Min Aung Lai and the junta have cut about one third of the country's GDP out. They're not going to be fussed about economic sanctions from that point of view, from the point of view of the country's performance, from the suffering of the people, etc. No, there's a different reason why we need to think about sanctions. When we think about sanctions on Myanmar today, we should not be thinking of changing behaviour, which is not coming, but reducing the capacity of the junta to do what it's doing regime capabilities rather than regime intentions should be our focus. Now this brings particular sanctions into mind, but particularly sanctioning of the country's banks. The tip of the spear, such sanctions are, for the US and some of our traditional allies, including I think to everyone's surprise in the last couple of weeks, Singapore. We should particularly think about sanctioning Myanmar's state-owned banks and some of the closest crony banks to the regime that are critical to the regime's ability to source and use foreign exchange and therefore to its financial armoury to wage war on their own people. I don't see, I used to be a banker at the Reserve Bank many, many years ago. Um, I don't see any barrier, any reason for Australia not to follow suit and sanction Myanmar's state-owned and crony banks. Myanmar today is not just the centre for narcotics money laundering, which it traditionally has been, and it was the original function, in fact, of many of the banks, but has become the core of financial cybercrime of epic proportions. Now, I mentioned that people are being trafficked into Myanmar these days. They're being trafficked into these new cyber cities, which have become very central, core, to what is a global criminal network that does a lot of the scams that we're familiar with whenever we answer a telephone, uh, but all sorts of other ways as well that entrap people right through Southeast Asia and beyond. If only for self-protection, we need to keep Myanmar's banks far away from us and sanctioning them is one way of doing that and one way of not only sending a message to Myanmar's junta but also reducing their capability to wage war. <clears throat> 
Just some final comments then that sort of bring together this idea about foreign policy and, and my experiences. Australia in many ways has a highly effective foreign policy simply in being, in being the country we are, in displaying the values that we do, much of which, again, was on display during my time in Myanmar. I have seen how powerful this is. I think it's there all over my particular case. But in the end, it's a muscle, if that's what it is. It's a muscle toned by values in action. In an otherwise too cynical world, actions founded in values still mean something for the people of Myanmar and for us safely outside. Thank you to the University of Tasmania for allowing me to talk to you tonight, uh, to Chancellor Alison Watkins, to my old friend Nick Farrelly, uh, to Sarah Golden, uh, who did much of the work here by, behind the scenes. Thank you to the family of Sir James Plimsoll for, for being with us. Um, thank you for his contributions to Australia, which again is, is very familiar to me. Thank you to the Australian Institute for International Affairs uh, and, the, and my old friends in the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade for sponsoring the event tonight. Um, finally, thank you to all of you um, here in this wonderful place in Hobart. Um, let me just say a little bit of wrinkle on that. Um, one of the books I was given when I was in the prison, and maybe in the Q&A we might talk about the books because uh, they really saved my life, but one of the books that arrived to me when I was in the prison was a book I absolutely loved before I was in the prison, which was Robert Hughes' great epic, The Fatal Shore. <laughs> but there I am, sitting in a dank, dark cell of brick and concrete with rusty old iron bars. I was pushed into the cell and had my handcuffs removed, my leg irons removed, and opened the book of The Fatal Shore to read about the convicts in Van Diemen's land. <laughs> so uh, it, it wasn't sort of escapism, but anyway, um, I grasped it nonetheless. Um, yeah, so thank you for, for coming here. Thank you for inviting me to this beautiful island. Thank you to everyone who were listening to me online. Thank you for listening to me more, more broadly. Um, and thank you for everything else. Because again, as I mentioned, the entire 650 days I was in these dank, dark cells uh, in Myanmar, I knew the number of people were behind me. On that, I never doubted for a second. I knew they'd come from Australia. I knew they'd come from America, from Britain, from Singapore, from Vietnam, from all over the world, from New Zealand even. Um, I knew people were, were behind me. Uh, it saved my life. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Sean. That was, uh, that was quite remarkable, your reflex reflections on our country, your reflections on those 650 days um, and your characterization of, of what it means to be the citizen of a liberal democracy, however imperfect it may be, um, and the strength um, that that provided you through those incredibly grim months and then into years. One of the things that strikes me, Sean, about our liberal democracy is that we want conversations, we want questions. Um, you and I have had a bit of a discussion already. You've covered a lot of ground. Um, there's plenty of people here who I'm sure are going to want your perspective on everything under the sun. Um, so if you're up for it, what we'll do is we'll bounce this around. Um, we'll, we'll maybe start with a question uh, coming in uh, through our chat function. And thanks very much to those of you online um, who are, are putting your questions through to Sean. Um, and then we've got some roving microphones here in the room as well. Um, and if you could just briefly identify yourself um, before you ask your question of Sean, um, that would be wonderful. So we have an, an anonymous attendee to begin with, Sean, online, who, who's got a big question for us, an important one. Is China a major sponsor of the military takeover of the country? Or perhaps to reframe that, how does China fit in? Sean. Well, the short answer is yes. Um, so Myanmar's regime has very few friends. Um, in fact, it has only real one friend, and that's Russia. Um, I, I used to, every so often we would get the state-owned newspaper in the prison, and we would see pictures of Min Ong Lai, the, the head of the junta, visiting. It was usually some 
outpost of right it was never even moscow it was bloody vostok or it was a tractor factory somewhere in in the urals or whatever um and it was so pathetic um it really was a phrase i mentioned earlier um in in talks here at the uni you know the the two kids that nobody else liked in the playground that were sort of forced together um and um you know neither country has much to offer each other except for military equipment um, and in fact, it's interesting just on that front that um, uh, obviously Russia provides Myanmar with lots of equipment, but because of the huge use of munitions and so on that Russia is facing against Ukraine, there's actually a flow back the other way as well, which is, I think, you know, extraordinarily an horrible development. Um, so Russia's the only real friend, uh, although, but China is in there um, being incredibly opportunistic. Um, so. During the time of the civilian government, for instance, we'd done some what I thought were really great negotiations to really dampen some of the damage of some of those build, big Belt and Road Initiative pro projects, some of the ones that brought with it, you know, truckloads of debt. We've been able to re renegotiate some of that. Well, they're now all back on, all back on. Um, likewise, now with no other friends, Myanmar has no option but to trade with China. So Myanmar's resources sold cheaply to China. Um, whatever it is, you know, maybe it's production that is incredibly environmentally damaging or, or unhealthy in various ways. Well, why not put it in Myanmar? Because it's not in a position to say no. So um, China, I think, is in an odd position. It supports Myanmar's regime because America is against it. That's rule number one. Number two, though, it is behaving, I think, in a sort of opportunistic way, but with reservations, because I'd have to say that Myanmar's regime is regarded as mad and bad, even by Beijing. They're not reliable. I think for the Chinese, it would be a case of, what the hell are you doing? You know, you can be a dictatorship and still be functional, would be, I'm sure, would be what their uh, message is. Um, and Myanmar is, is none of that. Thanks, Sean. We've got um, some hands up in the middle of the room, and we have a question over here on the site. Thank you. Hi there. Thanks so much, Sean. My name is Ali Jenkins. Um, this maybe draws on the point you were just making about the mad and bad. Oh, thank you. Drawing on the point you just made about the mad and bad, um, you talked about how Australia's values inform action. How would you characterise Myanmar's? Um, what are Myanmar values and Ooh. to what end? Well, so he very important distinction, of course, between the values of the Myanmar people and the value of the regime. So um, the values of the Myanmar people uh, are extraordinary and, and extraordinarily good. So one of the things, I'm really glad you asked me this actually, because it gives me an opportunity um, to say that, so I was in prison in Myanmar, I suffered in Myanmar and saw all the bad things in Myanmar, but the people who saved my life were people in Myanmar. Um, and, you know, I've mentioned the support from Australia and so on, um, but there was incredible support from people in Myanmar as well. And mostly my fellow prisoners, and these were people who had nothing. I mean, in many ways, you know, my situation was awful, but in the end, I knew I had a whole government and country behind me. I knew that one day I would come home. They have none of that, none at all. And for the most part, they're poor. Uh, their family have terrible difficulties in, the regime makes it really difficult for family members to support prisoners and all that. And so notwithstanding that these are people with nothing and certainly no power, incredibly vulnerable, they would do extraordinarily courageous things to look after me. Um, I was always the weakest of the runt. No, the runt of the, <laughs> the runt of the litter. <laughs> Get the metaphors mixed up. Um, so, but they looked after me. And so their values, you know, I have no doubt about. Um, it, it's a country with, you know, and Nick, you know this more than me, that, that, uh, it's a country steeped in Buddhism um, and, and all the good things that, that come from that. Um, amongst the military, wow, you know, um, there are a number of individual motivations, I think, going on. The senior leadership desperately worried that the civilian government was going to give them up to the International Criminal Court because of the genocide against Rohingya. No question about that, I think, as part of the motivating factor. Um, they were running up against all sorts of age barriers that they wanted to be in control, et cetera. But probably above all, they are extraordinarily xenophobic and narrow, ignorant, uh, and all that goes with it. So for them, anything that's foreign, and it could be Rohingya that they would regard as foreign, they're not, but they would regard anyone who looked different to them as being foreign. They would regard somebody like me as foreign. 
anyone different to them is the enemy. And it, it really doesn't get much more beyond that. I know that sort of sounds a bit simplistic and so on, but um, these are not the brightest tools. Sorry, I'm mixing it up again. <laughs> not the sharpest tools in the box. Um, and um, yeah, their motivations are of the bully, uh, the sociopath, the psychopath. I mean, that, that's where we are. But yeah, and certainly as far away from the values of the average person in Myanmar as possible to imagine. Great. Thanks very much, Sean. And thank you for the reflection uh, on, on values and, and um, what brings us all together. So I've got lots of questions coming through um, the chat. So I, I might come to them in a moment. Before I do, though, I'd like to take another question in the room. Thank you. Thank you. I'm uh, Kenneth. Um, being a political prisoner and an optimist, <clears throat> There's another very high profile political prisoner in the form of Julian Assange. Um, you're against the, um, come against the, the mercy of the Myanmar military, whereas Julian Assange is coming, is coming up against the US administration. Could you give us, or the audience, a praise of Julian Assange's predicament at the present time and his future, please? Um, I'm not sure I can. Um, in, sorry, I don't mean that I'm not allowed. <laughs> I, I don't really know much about it, to be honest, mate. Um, it was something that was in the background, I think, before um, I went in and, and, um, uh, and still going on afterwards. Um, it's not something I followed particularly. Um, I, I perhaps use this as an opportunity to say that um, one of the interesting things that, that enabled me to go on and, and have some optimism were the accounts of other people, um, and in particularly inspiring, uh, was the account of Kylie Moore Gilbert, who I think people might know who's imprisoned in Iran unjustly for 800 and something days. Um, I, I was actually given that book. That, that book arrived to me in, in the prison. Um, and also on one of the conversations that my wife Ha had with me in one of our allowable conversations, she said to me that she'd been contacted by Kylie from Melbourne. And I thought, She's Kylie from Melbourne. And first I thought, are they talking about Kylie Minogue? Is, is costing me. Um, and then I thought, and it was actually about a few days afterwards, I thought, oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. That lady who had been released just before I was arrested, she was Kylie. And then my wife sent me Kylie's book, An Uncaged Sky, wonderful book. And I read the book in the prison. The, the prison authorities, by the way, were bizarre with what they allowed in in books and what they wouldn't. So they allowed Kylie's book in, but they wouldn't allow a memoir of a cruise ship captain. <laughs> that was regarded as beyond the pale. They allowed Kylie's book in. They allowed George Orwell's 1984 in, which, as Nick knows, is very much a book about Myanmar. Um, <laughs> but anyway, they, Kylie's book was allowed in, and it was absolutely inspiring. Um, so, yeah, sorry, don't really know much about Julian's case, but just to say that you know, the, the uh, resilience, et cetera, of other political prisoners, but, you know, Kylie Moore Gilbert really comes to mind, was wonderful to me. It gave me incredible coverage and uh, courage and, um, and, and support when I needed it. Thanks very much, Sean, and thank you to our audience member for the question, which brings me now to some questions, Sean, that are, that are flowing in uh, here uh, through the app. Um, next question is from Kylie Moore Gilbert. Oh. Wow. <laughs> okay. So thank you, Kylie from Melbourne. Uh, and she says, Dear Sean, thank you for your wonderful address. And this is her question. Given hostage diplomacy appears to be on the rise globally, uh, with Australians increasingly affected, how can Australia develop a more considered policy to tackle and disincentivise the phenomenon? Big question, Sean. It, it is a difficult one, and, and it gets to the heart of the dilemma that I mentioned and, and why, I mean, I called them cruel twists, right, because I felt it at the time. I thought, gosh, you know, my head is telling me, uh, and all my work on Myanmar is telling me that Australia needs to be really strong on this, needs to stand up. And then I thought, okay, that's sort of Professor Sean, but he's actual Sean. Right, sitting there in a prison and thinking, oh gosh, <laughs> what will happen to me if they do that? Um, so, you know, that, those, those feelings were, were very much there. Um, I mean, I, I guess my answer would be, um, and which may have come from the lecture, but, but um, you know, what, one of the things I thought about when I was putting some thoughts together with the lecture was that, I, that it was a very nuanced idea that I was trying to get across, which, um, yeah, it's interesting, because I, I guess my, my point is, that 
by standing up to its values, Australia presents its own best self to the world, and that is a powerful message to people around the world. That, that's foreign policy. I think the expression I used was foreign policy in being as opposed to foreign policy in action. But at the same time, foreign policy in action was required to undergird that foreign policy in being. You know, it wouldn't mean very much if we, if we kept caving and all of that. Um, so I guess it's also, I think, a very much case-by-case -case thing. Um, but, you know, again, as Kylie would know much more than, than I, many of these regimes, when it comes to this sort of stuff, are, are quite transactional. And so countries, in a sense, can walk and chew gum at the same time. That is that they can uh, do sometimes what's needful for individual prisoners, while at the same time going strong in condemning, you know, military coups and genocides and all the other terrible things that they, these regimes tend to do. Um, I think it is possible to do uh, those two things at the same time, because many of these regimes are utterly cynical. Um, and I know if, in Kylie's case, certainly Iran, I think, would, you know, f for all its pretensions, would be firmly in that camp. And likewise, Myanmar as well. You know, that, that issue about what are the values of Myanmar's leaders, I mean, they really don't have any values. It, it, it's utterly transactional. Um, yeah, so I guess that those two things, that, that to the extent possible, Australia has to stand firm in condemning uh, these regimes, um, but that need not preclude individual uh, transactions as much as possible that don't, you know, breach some of those those values. It, it's a it's such a good question though because you know again it was something that I that I thought about in the in the prison all throughout. Um, what do I want Australia to do? Um, I might add too. This just prompts um, something which was important to me, which was to find out through various sources, by the way, that Australia didn't trade off anything for me. That that was really important to me to know. Um, and I think from Kylie that, 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 that sort of thing was important as well. So, um, yeah, so it gave me comfort in my own situation that knowing that that, 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 that was the case. Great. Thank you, Sean. We have another question in, in the room. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I was always a bit mystified by why the junta would be concerned about an economics advisor. So the question is two parts. What was your economic advice seen to be uh, a threat to their economic interests? Uh, and if not, were there other expat in your kind of position? Yep, uh, great question. Um, yes, um, the economic reforms that we were undertaking um, were beginning, so we, we were really gaining traction. Um, for people who know about Myanmar, when the civilian government first came in uh, in 2016, and it was the civilian government that and as you know, Nick was very much contained by the military and all that. There was very limited scope for movement. But on economics, there was a bit. Um, it took a long time, but it was really beginning to gain traction towards the end of the first term. So this is around 2020, 2021. And in particular, I've mentioned the banks a couple of times. We were beginning to push against some of the crony banks. Um, so in Myanmar, the banks were not really banks. They were uh, they began, for the most part, to launder narcotics money. They later developed into sort of cash boxes for these crony conglomerates that were close to the military. Um, as the reforms were beginning to bite, they were coming under pressure. And there were some particular dates in 2021 uh, that they had to meet certain requirements. Likewise, there were two giant military companies that dominated parts of the economy. Um, the liberalising measures that we were putting in place all over the place were really undermining some of their revenues um, and some of the state-owned enterprises as well. So they were getting worried. Um, and in a, me, in a way that they used me, and I mentioned xenophobia and so on before, so well before I was captured uh, by the regime, they um, had already, in, in sort of military-aligned newspapers, I, I had already become a, a bit of a, not a hate figure, but, yeah, sort of a... Um, uh, <laughs> an ugly representative face, if you like, for reform. You know, that these were the foreigners. They were in there pulling the strings and undermining uh, Myanmar's, uh, you know, true sons of the soil sort of thing. So, um, uh, 
yeah, so so I think that's part of it. Um, and then there's a sort of final, very practical thing that led to my arrest. So, so, so they didn't like me, in other words, I think it's safe to say that's one thing. But the other thing, just opportunistically, I was there, um, but I couldn't get out. Um, just about everyone else who, who, uh, uh, who could get out had got out by then. But of course, everyone will remember, uh, February 2021, COVID was still in full swing. There weren't any flights couldn't get out there was you know I tried to get out but there was no way there was no seats on any plane so the fact that I was there I think could be used as a representative example of perfidious foreigners basically right thanks very much Sean we've got some more questions here in the room before we come to those just another quick one here um, from online this has come through from Kinzor questions are in two parts is there any negotiation on the table um, between, uh, for instance, the military and the national unity government for some type of peace process? And um, let's just assume something like that does emerge at some stage, Sean, the, the question is, should Australia support it? So, um, I mean, I think we can say without, and, and here I'm not um, basing this on any insight uh, with the national unity government or anything else, um, I th there does not appear to be anything like that on the table. I personally, I don't think it's possible. Um, I think the regime has way stepped beyond that now. Um, you know, I mentioned before that Min Aung Lai, you know, he, he really needs to be up before the ICC. Um, and that was before, um, you know, the, the regime, what, what separates this latest manifestation of military rule in Myanmar is just the savagery that is taking place. That, that seems to be the one tactic they have. Because um, they're in desperate straits. They, they control probably still a majority of the land area, but it, it wouldn't be much more than a majority. Um, they're on the back foot. They're in desperate straits when it comes to uh, financial resources, et cetera. Uh, they're just desperate, you know, overall. Um, and all they've got left, I think, is to try and frighten people with the, you know, the degree of their repression. I think they've gone beyond anything that can be negotiated now. I think it would be very difficult for anyone on the other side to negotiate with them. Um, so, um, and it wouldn't last. I mean, it, it would not be credible. So I, I would think that Australia shouldn't support it, but in a sense, I think that's an academic question because I think it's not on the table and won't be on the table. Thank you, Sean. Next question, please. Um, Sean, thank you very much for tonight. My name's Judy Tierney and I've thoroughly enjoyed listening to your reflections. Um, I was in Myanmar about six or seven years ago and it broke my heart to see women shoveling river gravel for about three bucks a day, and it was just tragic. But what I also noticed and detected quite definitely was the influence of the monks in the country. And I'm just wondering where they sit. They seem to be in cahoots with the military from what I could detect. There was a very, I spoke to many of them and there seemed to be an incredibly misogynist view of, um, of, of me and people within the country, women. So I'm wondering where they sit now and what influence, if any, can, as I say, is it true that they, they are in cahoots with the military and that they were also part of the Rohingya massacre and involvement there? Yeah. So I, I think the answer to both of those aspects, both against the, the atrocities against the Rohingya, um, but then also in terms of being in cahoots with the military, um, there are certain high profile monks uh, and monasteries uh, and, and groups who definitely are. I don't think there's any question about that. Um, the tragedy I think is that they overshadow what I suspect is probably the majority view. In fact, I don't suspect, I'm pretty certain of that, um, that, that the monkhood more broadly uh, would not support the regime uh, and were not, you know, involved in the atrocities against Rohingya. Um, having said that, though, you know, um, it is, I think, um, as an outside observer, it, it's interesting because we've seen the, the, the monks being very much the font of, of resistance and, you know, the famous back in 2007, the uh, Saffron Revolution, etc. We, we haven't seen that uh, this time around. Um, on that um, I'm, I'm not really expert enough to say, except that, you know, probably, again, the savagery that I mentioned that the regime seems to be willing to visit upon people these days, 
uh, doesn't exempt the monkhood and, and that that is probably part of the explanation as to why, you know, we're not seeing that so prominently. Um, I mean, having said that, though, you know, so many of them are, are part of the resistance, um, uh, the, the People's Defence Forces and so on. So, um, yeah, bit of a mixed picture. But I think probably the overall thing is being overshadowed by, you know, just some fairly high profile bad actors within that community. Great. Thank you. Next question, please. Sean, thank you. Um, my name is May Tanner. I spent some years in Myanmar as well, and I've worn my Myanmar coin earrings in your honour tonight. <laughs> um, my question is about optimism, um, your suggestions about sanctions removing some of the power of the dictatorship. Yeah. Um, given the ongoing support from China and Russia and perhaps others, is the greatest chance of hope the self-destruction of the regime itself from the inside? Yeah, wonderful question. And the short answer, I think, is yes to your last point. But let, let me elaborate on it. Uh, after thanking you for the earrings, <laughs> for wearing them. Um, yeah, so, you know, I was described as optimi optimistic and, and in general about life, and I'm owning up to that, whatever the, <laughs> the psychological motivation. Um, but I was asked today on a number of occasions about whether I felt optimistic about Myanmar, and I, and I said, no, um, I'm not. But then I added to it and, and thought, well, I'm optimistic in a negative way, in a sense, in that um, things have gone so far, the country dragged down so far, the regime, as I mentioned before, so desperate for foreign exchange in particular. Because, and, and this is why I keep highlighting the banks. It's not... It's not an issue that, you know, that they're just evil banks and blah, blah, blah. They're the ones who provide the wherewithal for Myanmar to get the munitions that they need. Myanmar is not like Russia. It doesn't produce stuff itself for the most part. It can produce a bit, but most of the important munitions it needs, it needs to import, and it needs foreign currency. China is not going to accept the Myanmar JAT, nor is Russia. It needs the foreign currency. So that's, that, that's why I'm, you know, particularly uh, focusing on those. Um, but but your point is is right in that in that to the extent I see optimism it, it's what's that old joke about um, an optimist who says it's the worst that can be and the pessimist says um, no wait a minute <laughs> things are worse things are, it can't get any worse that's right and the pessimist says oh yes it can um, so. So with that sort of theme in mind, um, I guess to the extent I see any optimism is exactly as you've suggested, a collapse of the regime, probably from within. Um, to give an, a very concrete example that's come up just in the last couple of days, um, the two most notorious private banks connected to the regime have just yesterday received a massive fine from the central bank for what was called profiteering in foreign exchange transactions. Now, this is remarkable because these, these two particular banks were welded on to the regime when, when they came in. Now it seems that the central bank, under the control of the regime, has turned against them too. So if one wants to follow the money to see where power is, and that's often what you need to do there, this suggests to me that there's really something going on. And again, just underlines that point about the desperation of a shortage of foreign exchange, et cetera. So, yeah, so to the extent that I feel any optimism at the moment, it's that I think the regime is really on the back foot. I think they're really struggling. And it seems to me that, that surely there might be more enlightened interests within that regime who might think enough. Um, having said that, we've spent decades thinking those sort of things, Nick, in Myanmar. I mean, we used to say this... 15 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, it, it can't get any worse. There'll, there'll have to be a palace coup. And we waited and waited. <laughs> so, um, yeah. I well, know we've got some more questions in the room. Before I come to you, I just have, have another quick one here, Sean, from, uh, from our online audience. Um, there's a lot of discussion coming through on our chat about ASEAN. Right. And we appreciate that the Association of Southeast Asian Nations has its own strengths, 
um, as a regional body, um, but also limitations. Um, the question from another anonymous attendee, um, it's, a, it's a sharp question, Sean. Are ASEAN countries running dead on Myanmar issues? Well, they would seem to be. Um, individually, having said that, individually, some of them are doing interesting things. And Singapore, in particular, very surprising what, what Singapore is doing. Uh, what looks like private sanctions, but, you know, there may be other hands involved as well. Um, so Singapore has begun to tighten the screws a little bit on Myanmar's banks and, and people of wealth, basically, who have sometimes seen that place as a bit of a safe haven. So that's interesting. Um, likewise, I think um, Indonesia uh, has been very vigorous during its term as the leader of ASEAN, which ends quite soon, uh, but it hasn't really gone anywhere. Um, probably as people here knows, there's a, a five point plan that ASEAN uh, put up. I think the most significant thing to me about the whole ASEAN story is that it used to be the case that past military regimes in Myanmar were very anxious to be seen to be cooperating with ASEAN. And again, as a point of difference between the current regime and past ones, now they don't care. In fact, they are, um, I mean, so ASEAN put out a, a, a finding about two days ago just saying that Myanmar was not living up to its agreement under this five point program. And Myanmar just got out and, say Myanmar, Myanmar's leadership got out and just tore strips off ASEAN. Like, it was really visceral stuff. You would never have seen that in the past. So um, they didn't care about ASEAN, you know, the, uh, as they don't care about the West, as they don't care about so many other things. So, um, you know, ASEAN's actions have been ineffectual. But as yet, nobody's actions have been effectual. You know, this is a regime that is not listening. Um, to ASEAN or anyone else. Thanks, Sean. We'll take one last question. Thank you very much. Peter Davison Gurley is my name. I'm a philosopher. Um, what I wanted to ask about has been partly covered, the role of China, the role of ASEAN. Um, insofar as there's anyone in an external position the country able to place pressure upon them, I would have thought it would be China. Um, but it's not just the ability to place pressure, it's the motivation to place pressure. So do you see any external actors that you'd be optimistic about that one can do something and two might be willing to do something? Um, yeah, again, great question. The reason why I keep harping on about financial sanctions is I think that's the one avenue where the West can still have an influence. Uh, it, it's our upper hand, if you like, I think, on that front. Um, but other than that, China is the player. If we look around others, it, it's really not, not anywhere else. Thailand a little bit, but, um, but China is, is a significant player. Um, I think I mentioned earlier that um, one of the success stories we had uh, well, the civilian government had was renegotiating some of the really bad Belt and Road Initiative deals that China had, had done. Um, but since the coup, that's all open, you know, and, and now China is going roaring ahead with some of these big projects, massive debt and all the rest of it. But having said that, that might prompt China to be a steadying hand, maybe, because they have, they've got a lot at stake. Their biggest single project, the so-called China-Myanmar Economic Corridor, is about a massive pipeline railway that goes all the way from Kunming in China right across Myanmar to a port in the Bay of Bengal called Jiaopu. Billions of dollars are being uh, spent on this, and China wants Myanmar to pay for it. That, that's the thing we push back on. Um, but it's immensely important to China because it strategically cuts out the Malacca Strait. So th this has always been the the um, what is the, the the holy grail, if you like, of Chinese foreign policy to avoid being blocked in the Malacca Strait by the Americans and the oil shipments and all that. So it's an immense importance to China. Um, now the trouble for them is okay, they can perhaps support here and there Myanmar's military, but the chaos of the country, the idea that all might just collapse into you know, never-ending violence means that that investment and other investments as well 
become problematic. So um, perhaps self-interest might allow China at some point to be a better actor than they are now. Thank you very much, Sean. Let's give him another round of applause, please. And I'd, I'd now like to invite Ruth Baird, uh, who, as I mentioned earlier, is the director of the Tasmania State Office of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, uh, to deliver a vote of thanks. Ruth. Professor Turnell, members of the Plimsoll family, Alison Watkins, Chancellor of the University of Tasmania, Professor Nicholas Farrelly, and other members of the university faculty. Kim Boyer, President of the Tasmania Branch of the Australian Institute for International Affairs. Ladies and gentlemen, I acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet, and I pay my respect to the elders, past and present. I extect, extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people present with us today and online. Professor, it's a real privilege to provide here our vote of thanks to you for delivering this year's Sir James Plimsoll Lecture in my role as Director of the Tasmania State Office of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. We were all deeply moved to hear the news of your safe return to Australia, and we were inspired by your positivity and your resilience in such difficult circumstances. The department staff in Canberra, Yangon, and in the region worked tireless, tirelessly to secure your release through all available channels, public and private. And consular assistance to Australians in difficulty overseas and their families is one of the most crucial services that we provide. It's an important and complex task, and on any given day, our department manages 1,500 consular cases. We often deal with Australians in difficult circumstances and people who are having the worst day or days of their lives. The department takes its consular role very seriously, and we aim to consistently provide a high standard of support. You can understand that we're very happy Professor Turnell is no longer one of these. You spoke of Australia's foreign policy and the broader work of the department in Australia and overseas. Our network includes over 120 embassies, high commissions, consulates general and representative offices across five continents. Diplomats, negotiators, consular officers and advisors who develop and then deliver Australia's foreign, trade and development policy on behalf of Australia and on behalf of Australians. You spoke too about the circumstances of Myanmar and the military coup in Myanmar has reversed years of democratic and economic and development gains and plunged the country into a deep political and humanitarian crisis. Australia strongly condemns the actions of the Myanmar military regime, and we continue to urge the regime to end violence against civilians, engage in dialogue, release those unjustly detained, and allow safe and unimpeded access for humanitarian assistance. Australia continues to support the people of Myanmar in their pursuit of peace, human rights, and a return to the path of democracy. Again, our sincere thanks for your remarks this evening to those of us here in the room, in the Stanley Burberry Theatre, and those joining online. We've been touched by your journey and your remarks on friendship. Thank you again. Thank you very much, Ruth. And I'd now like to introduce Kim Boyer, the President of the Australian Institute of International Affairs Tasmania branch, to deliver some final words on behalf of the Institute. Thank you, Kim. Thanks, Nicholas. And thank you to our partners. Thanks particularly to Alison Watkins for supporting the Plimsoll yet again. It's a great honour to have our Chancellor here. I just want to, uh, before I formally thank Sean, to uh, 
talk about a little bit about AI Tasmania, simply in that we are really doing our bit for political prisoners. Um, on a personal front, we visited Myanmar before the coup, and when I was preparing a couple of comments for tonight, my slideshow on the computer was wandering its way through Myanmar. It was, for us, a wonderful journey, a bit like Judy's, but sort of different because it was very rural. We met lots of people who were doing it tough, but were so happy and so part of that world and so gentle and loving. And every time I look at those photos now, I think, oh my God, what's happened to them? So there is a deep love, but also a deep sadness about Myanmar. And I can understand that Sean must feel that in spades. But in terms of the AAA in Tasmania and its um, involvement with political prisoners, um, a couple of years ago, we have two flagship events, this one, the Plimsa Lecture, and our Government House Lecture. In our Government House Lecture, we had Peter Grester, who had been in prison for not quite as long as Sean, but nearly as long in Egypt. He, Peter was a um, journalist for Al Jazeera and he's become a major lobbyist for freedom of the media and freedom of journalists across the world since that time. He, when he talked at Government House, said he was the first terrorist who talked at Government House because he was a terrorist. Sean tells me tonight that they're planning a, um, a forum of the terrorist and spy. So I think Tasmania should host it because we've got lots of expertise in this area. I can add to that from Kylie from Melbourne. Um, while we haven't had Kylie, we've certainly had Nick Warner, who was key in rescuing her from or negotiating her out of Iran. So I think we've played a really major role. I don't want any more political prisoners, please, but we're happy to help once they are released. So as well as that, we also have hosted Ian Kemish, who was head of the consular service in DFAT and who told us some terrific stories about what worked and didn't work in negotiations to free political and other prisoners in that, those situations. Like Peter and like Nick, Sean tonight has allowed us special insights into the wonderful qualities which kept him strong and resilient and his strong moral compass of democracy, support for an important developing nation who those of us who visited hold really extremely warmly in our hearts and his own warmth as a human being. For our part, we owe him immense thanks for his work there, his ongoing commitment and for his talk tonight. Thank you. And uh, thank you again to our honoured guest and speaker, Professor Sean Turnell. Um, thank you to um, our dear friends from the AIIA and, and from the department, um, to our Chancellor, Alison Watkins, for her ongoing support of the Plimsoll Lecture and also for her generous introduction to Sean this evening. Um, I'd also like to really thank all of you who've joined us uh, both virtually and in person uh, tonight. Um, I think contributing to this type of conversation about our country's diplomacy um, and about Sean's big theme of the power of friends um, is very much in keeping uh, with the mission of a university like this one. Um, We've all heard firsthand tonight about the impact of collective action um, and the positive difference that it can make uh, in the world. So, uh, Sean, uh, thank you for all of your words. Thank you also for your efforts um, to highlight the, the Plimsoll legacy. Um, and again, we're just um, so delighted that the Plimsoll family uh, continues to be a strong partner uh, in our annual lecture series. Um, everything that we've... Um, uh, that we've heard uh, today will be soon available as a podcast um, and you're going to be able to engage with that both through the university um, and of course um, the AIIA web pages as well. Um, finally, I'd like to say a few words about some other things uh, coming up here in our University of Tasmania Island of Ideas public lecture series. Um, this all started for those of you who aren't aware back in, in 2020 um, when, of course, we weren't able to do our usual in-person events. And the Island of Ideas series now continues 
2023 and, and into next year. Um, and we really do hope that it can connect communities uh, across Tasmania um, and that it can draw our research and researchers, uh, wonderful experts like Sean, uh, into our island's conversations. Um, I think we all know that this is at the centre of a great university, this type of collegiality um, and the community that it can foster. So on that note, uh, let's again thank Professor Sean Turnell uh, for his contribution uh, to uh, to all of us. Um, you have done great honour uh, to our Sir James Plimsoll Lecture Series, Sean. Um, we will always be proud um, to list your name among the other greats um, who have delivered the Plimsoll, um, noting that your experience has been remarkable. Uh, we all can't wait to see your book. Um, and I'm sure we're going to be seeing a whole lot more of Sean on our TV screens and no doubt we'll be listening to him, uh, radio, podcasts, you name it, over the months to come. So again, on that very positive note, um, please extend your appreciation to Professor Sean Turnell.